As you know, uh, in our world, there's great debate over what it means to be spiritual. Pentecost Sunday highlights that in a way unlike any other. Some of you know that my um, coming to age of faith came in the Assembly of God Church, where it was not uncommon for there to be talking in tongues for five or six minutes out of a service. Benny Hinn, the faith healer, if you've seen him on TV, came out of our church. He married our pastor's daughter. So I really have seen the gamut of what people define as spiritual or spirit-filled. But this passage from Galatians really does describe the practical implications of what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian. Very familiar words from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and then verse 25. And I'll be reading from the message about the fruit of the Spirit. But what happens when we live God's way. He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. Well, dear Pentecost people, scintillating seniors, all of you with ears to hear, as I sat down to write this letter, I was reminded of the story of my man, Jorge Rodriguez. Jorge was a Mexican bank robber who operated along the Texas border in the early 1900s. He was wildly successful in his chosen vocation. He was so successful in his thievery that the Texas Rangers deployed an extra posse of special rangers along the Rio Grande to try and stop him. Late one afternoon, one of the special rangers saw Jorge slipping quietly across the river back into Mexico. He trailed him discreetly while Jorge returned to his home village and then watched Jorge enter his favorite cantina to relax and have a few tequilas. The rangers slipped in, managed to sneak up on an unsuspecting Jorge Rodriguez, and putting the barrel of his pistol on Jorge's temple, the Texas ranger said, I know who you are, Jorge Rodriguez. I've come to get back all the money you've stolen from all the banks in Texas. Unless you give it to me, it is my intention to kill you right here, right now. There was just one flaw with this marvelously conceived plan. Jorge Rodriguez spoke no English. (laughs) The Texas Rangers spoke no Spanish. They were two adults at a verbal impasse. About that time, an entrepreneurial young Mexican approached the Texas Ranger and he said, I'm bilingual. Would you like me to translate for you? The Ranger nodded quickly, yes. The bilingual Mexican told Jorge Rodriguez who the Ranger was, why he was pointing a gun at Jorge's head. Very nervously, Jorge answered back, tell the big Texas Ranger I have not spent one cent of the money. Tell him to go to the town, well, face north, count down five stones, and reach behind the fifth stone. There he'll discover the money. Tell him this quickly before he shoots me. Very nervously, the Texas Ranger inquired, what did he say? What did he say? Leading the bilingual Mexican to respond in perfect English, Jorge Rodriguez is a very brave man. He says he is prepared to die. (laughs) 
Make no mistake about it, my friends, words are so important. Who says them? Who hears them? How the words are interpreted. As a preacher, I've learned I can open wounds with words, and I can close wounds with words. In my professional life, in my personal life, words have gotten me into trouble. They've gotten me out of trouble. Words matter, how you use them, how you translate them. And I have four words I want to send your way, Paige and Morgan, and all of you, on this Pentecost and graduation Sunday morning. Loving, shepherd, shoving, leopard. Those are the two images I want you to cling to for the rest of your days on this earth. As I prepared this sermonic masterpiece this week, I kept coming back over and over again to a passage of scripture that tells you really all you need to know about God. If I had one passage, I could encourage you to commit to memory. It would be the words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This psalm tells you everything you need to know, my soon-to-be graduated friends. It's a reminder that we have a present tense and not a past tense Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, not was. And that isness means this Lord is actively at work in your life, even when you can't see it, even when you can't feel it, providing for your needs, restoring your soul when you feel down and burn out, protecting you not necessarily from harm, but from losing who you are walking with you through the dark valleys of life. And that's a promise, Morgan and Paige, I want you to cling to as you face a class that you can't pass, a boss that you can't please, a job that you can't do, a biopsy that won't lie, or a friend who will, an addiction you can't kick, a lover you can't coax back. In the mountains of joy, and the valleys of despair that college and life inevitably bring. God is with you, always, so do not fear. And yet, although I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is a loving shepherd who loves you, who restores you, who walks with you, I've also learned that the Christian life is obscenely one-sided if it is only concerned with what God has done, will do, can do for you. It's sad but true, but that's where most people park on their spiritual journey. What can God do for me? I don't know if any of you remember that Janet Jackson song from the 1980s, What Have You Done For Me Lately? But that's how lots of people I know approach their relationship with God. What have you done for me lately, Lord? It never crosses their mind. God might be asking the very same question of them. Which leads me to the second and final image that I want you to cling to. There once lived an old British minister named W.A. Spooner, who was the dean of the new college at Oxford University and the head of the chapel there, who became so famous for his verbal slip-ups, they are now called Spoonerisms. For you adults, Spooner was the Yogi Berra of the preaching world. He would mangle words all the time. At a wedding once, he turned to the groom at the end and said, son, it is now customary to cuss the bride. (laughs) 
to two identical female siblings. He said, these are sin twisters instead of twin sisters. And on another occasion, while preaching on Psalm 23 and intending to tell his congregation that God was a loving shepherd, he instead boldly proclaimed that God was a shoving leopard, (laughs) which for my money is a greater statement of truth than W.A. Spooner ever knew, ever realized. Of course, it's important for you to know the Lord is a loving shepherd. But to have a full and rich faith and to have a full and rich life, you also must know that the Lord is a shoving leopard, always poking you, always nudging you, always pushing you to step out in faith and out of your religion of convenience, moving the focus off of what God can do for you and onto what you can do for God and others. As the Apostle Paul so powerfully says in our lesson from Galatians, let us not just hold our faith as an idea in our heads, as a sentiment in our heart. Let us work out its implications in every detail of our life. That's the kind of faith I want you to have, a faith that finds its rest in the arms of a loving shepherd and a faith that finds its meaning in being attentive and obedient to the loving shoves of the shoving leopard. One of the preachers I hope you'll listen to while you're away at school, beyond yours truly via YouTube, is a feisty woman named Nadia Boltz Weber who currently serves as the minister of the Denver Correctional Facility in Denver, Colorado. This is what she has to say about Pentecost, about Pentecost faith. What possible difference, she says, does this story about Pentecost make to those of us who have kids who aren't doing well in life and aging parents who just aren't doing what we think they should? What difference does Pentecost make to those who are always afraid, to the brokenhearted, to the incarcerated women I love inside my women's prison? Here's what I want to say about that, she says. When the gospel writer Luke, who also wrote the book of Acts, describes the scene and the people right after Jesus' resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and his sending of the Holy Spirit, here are the words that he uses. Perplexed, terrified, disbelieving, amazed, eyes closed, hopes dashed, foolish, astounded, hearts burning, startled, frightened, doubtful, joyful, wondering. All of those words are in Luke chapter 24. In other words, the first disciples were a lot like us. I find those words deeply comforting, she says. Upon these perplexed, terrified, disbelieving, foolish, frightened, doubtful, joyful, stumbling, bumbling humans, God pours out his spirit as both blessing and benediction. His words and his spirit comfort us just as a loving shepherd would. But his words and his spirit convict us, confront us, catapult us, just as a shoving leopard would. Years ago, she said, I wrote an unnecessarily long blessing that I have found myself offering hundreds of times in nearly every place I've spoken since then. I think it's something akin to what the Spirit was saying at Pentecost. Blessed are those who doubt Blessed are those who aren't entirely sure, who can still be surprised. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are those for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who have buried their loved ones for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are those who have loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are the mothers of the miscarried. Blessed are those who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. 
Blessed are those no one else notices. The kid who sits alone at a middle school lunch table. The laundry guys at the hospital. The night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the teens who have to figure out new ways to hide the new cuts on their arms. Blessed are the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is so hard. Blessed are foster kids and special ed kids and every other kid who just wants to be safe and wants to be loved. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of being human to their people. Blessed are the burned out social workers, the overworked teachers, the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessing people is our Lord's nature. It must be at the heart of our nature. And maybe, just maybe, that is the secret sauce of Pentecost. That you leave here today, Morgan and Paige, with our blessing as you are appointed by God to be his voice of blessing in this world. Like Jorge Rodriguez's interpreter in today's opening story, you are the one who translates the blessing to a world in much more need than you know or realize. Because you have been blessed by a loving shepherd, you have to pay attention to the nudges of the shoving leopard as he pushes you into your purpose to be the voice that always blesses. So as I wind this meandering letter down this morning, let me simply close with this. I think God's heart breaks in two when he sees people who are hurting, who are heartbroken, who are lonely, who are silently struggling right before our very eyes. The loving shepherd aches when that happens, and the shoving leopard's nudge is real. Pay attention to that nudge. Pay attention to what's going on around you. It always affects you. The point of Pentecost is to become more like Jesus. This Jesus who paid attention to things and to people that no one else paid attention to. Here's what I think. You're going to meet all kinds of people in your life, people you pass by every day who feel broken, they've been bullied, they've been hurt at home, sometimes emotionally, sometimes physically. They carry their silent struggles with them because they don't believe that they're worth anything. They look just like you on the outside, but their heart and their soul breaks on the inside. They need you to tell them that they matter to you and to God. The Pentecost prayer of the shoving leopard is found at the very top of your bulletin at the front. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Will you make that your every morning prayer to God? When you pray that prayer, when you pay attention to the nudges and act on them, that is when life-changing things happen. Just ask my friend, Mike Bro. Mike's the pastor at Heartland Community Church in Rockford, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. And it's his lesson in listening and blessing that I want to share with you as I close. I was 17 years old, he says. I was trying to figure out my life. So I said to God late one night, God, I just want to put my life in your hands. I want to follow you every hour of the day. I don't know what that means, God but I want to learn. And I've been trying to do that every day since. Every morning I roll out of bed and I say, I surrender this day to you. I have a to-do list, God. But if you have a to-do list, 
that supersedes my to-do list, let's do your list. Help me to listen. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. A few weeks, he says, after I first prayed that prayer, this is what happened. I was working at a gas station as a freshman in college. I was on my way to work one day, riding my bike. And like I did every day, I would pass by this housing project, and all these kids would be down there playing on the playground. I felt like God was saying to me on that particular day, go park your bike in the grass. You're early for work. Go down and shoot some hoops with those kids. Do you ever get those kind of promptings, he said, where you feel like God is saying to you, go say something to that person. Go give them a word of encouragement. Well, that day I felt really strongly God was saying to me, do this and do it now. I really hit it off with this one little guy, a little black kid, sixth grader named Willie. We just started talking trash to each other immediately on the basketball court. Found out Willie had four brothers and sisters. His mom was a single mom. I had so much fun that day. I thought, I'm coming here tomorrow. And so I said, I'll meet you back here tomorrow morning. He was there when I got there. After a while, he would come to basketball practice with me at my college. We just formed this bond. But when I left campus, I lost track of Willie. I heard he became a great basketball player in the state of Illinois. That's the last I heard of him until three years ago. I was sitting in my office at Willow Creek Church in Chicago, and the phone rings. The voice on the other end says, hey, is this Mike Bray? And I said, yeah. And the voice said, is this the Mike Bro who was a skinny little white dude with all kinds of hair who played mediocre basketball? Well, I'm bald now, he says, so I know this is a blast from my past. I said, who is this? The voice said, this is Willie. And I'm doing the Google search thing in my head going, Willie, Willie, Willie. Nothing is coming up. Finally, I said, I got to be honest with you, man. I'm trying to place you. Give me a little more info. And he said, you know, man, Willie, Centennial Court in college, basketball. I said, little sixth grade Willie? You've got to be kidding me. What have you been doing with your life? And he said, mainly cocaine. I just went, oh, man. And he said, yep, but I've been clean for eight months. I'm doing great. I met this girl. I said, that's the way it always happens, dude. He said, she started taking me to church with her. This past weekend, I surrendered my life to Christ. He said, the reason I'm calling you is because I was sitting around a table at this men's retreat, and one of the guys asked me, how did you start your spiritual journey? Who pointed you towards God? And I said, you know, the first Christian I ever met was some skinny little white dude with all kinds of hair who played basketball. His name was Mike Bro." He just lived the love of God, no pressure, just kindness and love. The guys at my retreat said to me, are you talking about the Mike Bro who's a pastor in Chicago? He didn't know what I was doing with my life. And after a few more minutes of catching up, Willie said to me, Mike, I was just wondering if you could drive down to Bloomington tonight and baptize me. So I got in my truck, and I drove two hours south, and I can't tell you what a moment it was for me baptizing Willie as a brother in Christ. We stood there, and we embraced. We cried. Thirty years after I parked my bike in that grass, all because I listened and paid attention to a still, small voice that said, Stop. Go do this. Go give that person a word of encouragement. So this is what I wondered, he says, on my drive home from Bloomington last night. How many moments like that do I miss because I don't stop to pay attention and listen for the voice of God. Who pointed you towards God? His friends asked Willie. 
the person who felt a nudge from the shoving leopard, who stopped, who looked, who listened. Paige and Morgan, may you two always do the same. With all my love, Pastor Bob.